You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. All right, here we go with another episode of the Straight to Video podcast. Hope you and yours are doing okay out there and things are going good. We're cruising through July and 2023 is simply not slowing down. Lots happening with Straight to Video right now as ever. What with the podcast, lots of clips being added to our YouTube channel. But also this weekend is the first birthday of our 80s video shop over in Alfreton, Derbyshire. Can't believe Chris and I have been doing this shop for a whole year. It's gone so fast, but hopefully that's an indicator of the fun we've had. If you're in the Alfreton, Derbyshire area, just 10 minutes from Junction 28 of the M1, then please swing by this Sunday between 12 and 6, where we'll be having a small one-year birthday celebration with some snacks and screenings all day. It'd be great to see you. Today, though, on the show, I had a really cool conversation with Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, guitar journeyman and singer-songwriter Ricky Bird. Some of you will know Ricky from his decade-long role as guitarist with Joan Jett and the Blackhearts, which took him all over the world. Since then, Ricky has not taken his foot off the gas and has performed with the likes of Ian Hunter, Roger Daltrey, and has shared the stage with a who's who of rock royalty. It would probably be easier to list who he hasn't performed with. As a solo singer-songwriter, he has released albums focusing on addiction recovery and becoming something of a spokesperson and his songs have helped many people who are struggling. Right now he's releasing new music and singles through Little Steven's Wicked Cool Records label with the latest single Luan out right now. We had a fun chat about his new music but Ricky also shared some brilliant stories from his rock and roll history and above all showed what a fan he is still to this day. This Straight to Video podcast is proudly presented to you in association with Affinity Photo, which is an incredible piece of photo editing software, which I've been using for graphic design the past couple of years. It's used to create the podcast episode artwork you see each week. And what's cool is it's an extremely affordable alternative to other programs on the market. So if you have chance, please check them out at affinity.serif.com. All right, let's get into this. If you want to learn more about Ricky's amazing history, pick up some of his music or just stay connected, then everything can be found at rickybaird.com or through wickedcoolrecords.com. But right now, please enjoy my straight-to-video chat with the recovery troubadour, Ricky Baird. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm okay. How you doing? Yeah, pretty good, sir. Pretty good. How's the rest of the fifth look since we're on hours earlier than you? How's it turn out? We're just coming up to 6 p.m. here, so um, winding up. <laughs> yeah, you're my last Zoom thing for today, and I'm going to go out in the backyard and get some sun. Oh, sweet, man. First off, how was your 4th of July? Oh, uh, dude, it was noisy. <laughs> My neighborhood takes it very seriously. Right. Besides the official ones in Manhattan, the Macy's uh, fireworks. Yeah. The neighborhood decides to blow everything up. Whereabouts are you in relation to Manhattan these days? I'm like 20 minutes out, sort of by JFK and Queens. All right. Okay, cool. Pretty much where you grew up, like your teenage years and stuff like that then. Yeah. I mean, I, I was born in the Bronx and lived there until I was 13, maybe. Uh, and then moved to Queens, a different part of Queens that I'm in now. And I spent my, most of my teenage years there. Is your house still there, though, where you grew up in? Is that still around? Well, it was actually an apartment. The one in the Bronx is still there. It's not looking the way it looked when I was a kid. But the one in, in Queens, yeah, because it was right next to the high school that I went to, like next door. You know, Interestingly enough, I was still late every morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the problem. When it's so easy, you just push it as much as you can. It's like, I can do it. It'll yeah. be fine. In yeah. fact, I would go to homeroom class and every single morning, the teacher, Mr. Solomon, he'd say, Mr. Bird, so glad you decided to join us this morning. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't turn up, they knew you were just like next door, so they could come looking for you. Exactly. But because it was next door and it was the early 70s, because I graduated high school like in 73, you know, I spent more time in the apartment listening to like the new Zeppelin record or something or the new Slade record because it was right there. You know, say, hey, come on, let's go back to my place. You know, parents were at work. There you go. So we'd sit around and blast the new uh, Who record, Live at Leeds or something. I really enjoyed your um, interview with Ryan Roxy. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was for the last record. Yeah, he's a good dude. 
And I never realized you did a project with, I don't know how far the project got, but with Eric Stacy from Faster Pussycat. Oh, for sure. Like, I don't even remember how I met him. But after I left the Black Hearts, I immediately went out with Roger Daltrey. I did an album with him. Soon after, I went out with Ian Hunter. I did a tour of Sweden and parts of England. And then I was back in New York. And I was trying to figure out what I sounded like, you know, what I sounded like. And Eric was in part of that mishmash of <laughs> trying to find out what Ricky Bird sounds like. When was that? Was that kind of like mid-90s kind of time? Yeah. That's when everybody was trying to figure out what they was doing around that time. Well, I left the Black Hearts in 91. One, you know, I did. I came back and did a, a VH1 thing in '92, but and then it was. I think Daltrey was like '93, Ian was '94, something like that. And then I spent a lot of time trying to figure out who I was, and it took a while. I mean, I think I finally came to the conclusion now what my music sounds like, and basically what it is is. I mean, I did my first solo record in Lifer, and I think that came out in 2013, if I'm not mistaken. And then two follow-ups were Clean Getaway, Sobering Times, and those were based on recovery because I've been in recovery since '87. And now this new music, doing singles with Wicked Cool Records, little Stevens label. But uh, what I was saying was, I think I came to the conclusion who I am is a solo Sort of a big box of stuff that I grew up on. How crazy. It's almost like full circle. Like you revert right back to the stuff that had that initial magic impact on you. Well, for a long time, I mean, it's obviously what my influences are. It's obvious. But for a long time, like even the band with Eric, you know, there was some cool songs, but it was basically like Stone's throwaways. I wasn't quite there yet. You know, I wasn't writing as well as I write now. And I, the subject matter was probably not right. And then I came to a conclusion that I'm just going to I want to make music that has the same kind of quality and excitement and ear candy that the music that I listened to when I was 13 and 14 in that room next to the high school, like when I'd have the earphones on, I'll never forget. It was a Faces record. They were one of my top 10. But somewhere along the line, somebody, I think Woody yells, right, you know, it's just like a random, and it would scare me every time. I was probably smoking a lot of pot at the time too, but... <laughs> But every single time. So when I record, I want to have little bits. It's like when Keith Moon yells, I saw you in the fade at the end. Is it I could see from? No, no, ha Happy Jack. You just hear, I saw you. Almost like accidents that perhaps happened in the studio. Are like, oh, we'll keep that. Yeah. And you just go, oh, no, let's leave, let's leave that. Yeah, let's leave that. Yeah. So if you listen with headphones to my stuff, there's a lot of really cool bits, you know, even guitar bits. I'm big on background vocals. I do all the vocals myself, basically. The last two records I had, a couple of my friends, Christine Ullman, who's a great soul singer here in, in the States, and Jeff Kazee, who plays on everything I do, plays keyboards, who plays with Southside Johnny. So they did a lot of the backgrounds. And a girl named Marge Raymond, who was in a band called Flame and also sang backgrounds for a lot of people like ELO and this and that. But this one, for time purposes, you know, it's hard arranging people. Why is that? Everybody, that seems to be like worldwide. Well, because then we had nothing better to do and now we're all adults <laughs> is what it is. <laughs> yeah, we have plans now, right? Like booking a rehearsal for something is impossible. <laughs> yeah. And also the studio that I record in is way out in Long Island. It's like about 45 minutes from me. So it's a whole process to get people in the same room at the same time. So I just, I love singing my stuff. Nobody can sing backgrounds better with me than me. Well, there you go. And I love throwing bits in, you know, I, I mean, I love the Beach Boys too, and all the like Mata Hoople kind of harmonies and stuff. So there's all of that stuff on my records. It's all my original songs, but I can't help but write the way that I grew up, you know, the music I grew up listening to. And I think that's a good idea because there's not a lot of that around. Just released this new single, Luan, again through Stevie Van Zandt's Wicked Cool label. Is this your third single release after Glamdemic Blues and Alien? Yeah, the first one was Glamdemic Blues, and that's total glam, right? And I wrote that because I was sitting in this spot I'm sitting in right now for three years, trying to do stuff online, obviously, during the pandemic when it was hot and heavy. That's what Glamdemic Blues is about. Musically, it's what I grew up on. I don't think about it. I just sit down with one of those guitars. That's Frank and Telly over there, body parts. And I just start playing something. And I don't go, oh, that's too glam or that's too this or that. I just go with it. And the response that I get from people is, oh, man, that reminds me a little bit of ELO or it reminds me of the Stones. Or You got a little slate in it. I'm like, uh, baby, that's the right words I want to hear. Do you like this way of getting music out to people with individual songs rather than a full album? Or is it just kind of like new territory? Well, it's definitely new territory for me. So I put those two records out, right? Now, the two recovery-based records, the lyrics, and the music's the music, but the lyrics are based on addiction and recovery, or it speaks to, let's say. Those songs came from the fact that, you know, one of the things I do is it's my other, I got two Facebook pages. One is Recovery Troubadour. And so I would go around to treatment facilities, and I would do recovery music groups. And I started with only three or four songs. 
Then I had six songs. Then I had eight songs. And the thing was, every time I finished one of these groups and I'd play to the clients in treatment, they'd say, where can we get this music to take home when we leave here? And eventually, after procrastinating, I said, I guess I got to record it, right? And that's where those, the music came for those two records. Such an organic way for it to happen, though. It wasn't like oh, totally. super thought out. Just, no, 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 not at all. It just happened, yeah. It was just like I kept writing songs. And I was in this mode where I was writing songs about that kind of stuff. And I would get subject matter from going to these treatment facilities and somebody would raise their hand. My hour of recovery music group would be playing a song, you know, talking a little bit about the lyrics. Oh, what did you hear in the lyrics? Does that sound like you? Like, do you identify with anything? And somebody would say something and I mentally, make, oh, that's good subject fodder. And I'd write it down in my head. And when I got away, I'd write it on my phone. Like, oh, let's write a song about this. So sometimes somebody else's story as well as your own. Yeah, it would be something that they, somebody else was going through or something. Obviously, I went to all the same stuff. But I would take little bits that people would say as far as the subject matter. And that's where those two albums came from. So I put those two out, three all together. And I was going, you know, I spent all this money recording these records. Thank the Lord that Stephen Van Zandt, who single-handedly saved the rock and roll that I grew up on by having underground garage, because otherwise there's no place to hear any cool music. You know, classic rock stations, I don't know what's going on in England, but classic rock stations, you hear the same 50 songs. Bad Company, Journey, uh, Sticks. You don't hear Sticks over here. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, I, I, I see. <laughs> but Stephen plays, and I heard he does the program directing. You know, there's a program director, Dennis Mortensen, but Stevie like picks the tunes, you know. It could be Otis Redding, and then it could be the Cocktail Slippers, and then it could be... It's all the same family tree. It kind of is, yeah. Soul, rock and roll, punk, you know, it's all kind of... But I said, I spent all this money, and then Stephen will play one or two songs. And for the recovery records, granted, I, I still get messages from people that are in recovery that I played to in treatment back then that say, man, I still listen to that stuff, and it still affects me, and it keeps me sober. And They're out there now for people to still discover and people to keep going back to. Right. So it was worth doing full albums for that, because there's like jewels on there that are like the last song, you know. But what is it like when you get a record? How often do you listen to the whole record? Maybe when I was 16 years old, I'd be like, yeah, I'd exactly. devour it. But nowadays... It's... But some of the best stuff is stuff that's like three quarters through. And I always end the albums with a beautiful ballad. We go back and listen to those two. So when it was time to write new music, two things I said is, OK, I'm done with writing about recovery for a while. I got plenty of songs for the next freaking five years, of course. And then came Luann, but that's a whole other story. And I said, you know what? I want to do singles like Tommy James. I want to put singles out. So I told Van Zant and Dennis Mortensen, they said, yeah, great. So I signed a singles thing with them and I submit songs. And if they think they're great or if they think it belongs in the station, them them with Blues was first. Then I sent them Alien. Now you can see my lyric writing is completely different than when I would have written 20 years ago. Alien is about, I had a dream that I was in a sit down like a mob sit down with like four or five aliens from an old movie with one of those tables with the light hanging over the table. What had you been watching the night before? <laughs> well, yes, I watched The Day the Earth Stood Still. And that's what the movie's about is they come here to say, look, dude, get your shit together or you're done. So I had this dream that I was sitting at this table having <laughs> a sit down with these aliens and Stephen was there. You know, dreams are weird, right? So it was like, was he Stephen or was he Silvio from The Sopranos? <laughs> He was like the mediator. And so I wrote, I sat down and I wrote Alien. And I, I'm really proud of the lyrics. I don't think a lot of people got the lyrics or I don't know if people listen to them. I post them sometimes. Is there anybody out there taking stock of who we are? You know, I listened to it. I thought it was more about being like an individual in like everyone else is like cookie cutter. But if you're into like a certain kind of music, you sometimes feel alienated from everyone around you. Well, I, I like when people get their own meaning from it. But if you read it again, the lyrics are basically, if there's anybody out there taking stock of who we are. It must blow your mind since the start of time. We've not come very far, right? For there are those that still fear anyone who might look different than they do. I mean, that's what we're going through now. This is specifically about racism. This beautiful world has an ugly side, thinly veiled, you see right through. Speeches have been given, books have been written. We go marching in the name of love, right? Two steps forward and three steps back. You call that progress? I'm not too sure about that. You know, and it's alien. What must you think of us for all we've done to this here Mother Earth? Next verse is, don't get me wrong, in this world, there's much love and kindness to be found. It gets overshadowed by the constant noise of politicians, hucksters, and clowns. And that says a lot about our system here and yours as well. Every day, humanity goes 12 rounds of heavy blows. We spin the wheel where it stops, nobody knows. But from where you sit in your galaxy, talking to the aliens, 
It's all just dinner and a show. <laughs> Did all that just flood out after you'd had that dream? Totally. I mean, you know, I pick and choose and edit and make it better. And then at the end, my little Ricky Bird sense of humor <laughs> is where I go, I speak and I go, any advice would be much appreciated because obviously we've lost the plot. And then I go, by the way, if you run into Major Tom, give him our best. <laughs> nice one. Nice turnaround. So I'm, I'm hitting all, all the points here. This is a little bit of nostalgia about anybody that's not over a certain age is going to know who Major Tom is. But I do it because like, I know who he is. Talking of singles, was you like a, um, I know you mentioned about listening to like Led Zeppelin in your old apartment and stuff like that, but was you like a 45, seven inch single kid growing up in the Bronx and Queens? Would you buy a lot of singles? Yes, I did. I wish I had them. I don't know what, what happened to them. I remember it was in a little green box. I remember buying Honky Tonk Woman, the single, because it was only a single. It wasn't on an album, right? At that point. Yeah. And I had a lot of 60s singles. Do you have a favorite record store out in New York? Back in those days, you could go into a, like a big like department store and they'd have a record division. Kind of like we had White... I know you had Woolworths as well, but we had Woolworths that had record stores. Yeah. Yes, Woolworths had singles. Yes, that's right, records. But also where I grew up in Queens, there was a place called Record Spectacular and it had like black lights in the store. You could buy black lights and it had like Jimi Hendrix posters you know, on the walls. And that's where I got, you know, every picture tells a story and brain capers, you know, Mata Hoopla or something like that. But there was a guy actually in Queens that had a lot of imports. I was wondering that because like UK music, that's been a huge influence on your sound and career. But I wondered if the records of bands you became a fan of, if they were readily available or if you had to find the import records. Interestingly enough, <laughs> I met these guys. So I was hanging out at, you know, rock and roll, famous rock and roll clubs when I was like 16 with Phony Proof. One of them is Max's Kansas City. And in fact, see this shirt? You ever hear of Manny's music? I don't know if I have or not. Okay. So Manny's music, there was 48th Street was the music block in Manhattan. And there were all these music stores. Manny's was the biggest. And we used to go down there, me and my friends. Well, first I'll say I met these guys. They didn't live in my neighborhood, but they lived in Queens. And they had already been to England. So they had velvet suits and platform boots. You wanted to know all about that then. You were drawn to them. Well, we started playing together in a band, but they had more info than I did. So we used to go into the city and get Melody Maker and NME every week. And that's how I learned about all these English bands, right? You know, Slade, Roy Wood's Wizard, The Move. Or is it just Move? I think it's just Move, if I'm not mistaken. It's a little piece of trivia there. We got to find <laughs> out. You know, Faces. That was also Faces. It wasn't yeah. the Faces. Humble Pie, of course, was one of my favorite bands. In fact, in 1973, in my high school, we played the school in the auditorium. We opened up with Four Day Creep, which was on Rock and the Film World. And later on, I'm all over the place now, brother. I got to be friends with Steve Marriott and had spent a lot of time with them. But Humble Pie was one of my favorite bands. But so I met these cats and they had velvet suits and, you know, they turned me on to these cool clothing stores in the city. Of course, I had no money to buy clothes at that point. You'd sell the New York Times over the phone so you'd have enough money to buy like a T-shirt with a big star on it. And then you'd go to the club at night on a Saturday. But these guys turned me on to all of these bands. And then they kind of lived near that other record store that had imports. So we would go there and I would get all these cool records. And that's how I learned my stuff is from... From these guys and i'm still friends with most of them was you able to hear these bands before and or did they just say oh this is a new band from the uk so he's like i gotta have it i've got to listen to it whether i'd heard of it or not there was a turning point where am radio which was fabulous especially in new york am radio in new york was amazing when i was a kid because it was almost like little stevens underground garage because they would go from trini lopez to dean martin to under my thumb to the kinks if it was a hit it was a hit like top 40. So my whole input, soaking up music, because I had great radio stations. So I love Dean Martin. I love Frank Sinatra. I love, you know, Sammy Davis and all that stuff. But there was a point where everything turned to FM radio. And it was like, wait a minute, they're playing album sides. That was like a new experience. I know you guys had pirate radio. That's how you guys learned a lot of good stuff. Hey, man, it's all like that. Listen, how did Elvis hear... Big Mama Thornton, he'd sit in his bed with his little transistor radio and he'd pick up a station. Yeah, just dialing in. Got to find something. 50 miles away that played only black music. And that's how he heard that stuff. We all have our ways that we hear this music. Then the local WNEW, FM, PLJ, you would hear some of that stuff. I can hear the grass grow by move or of course you heard Stay With Me by the Faces. But then you'd want to hear Small Faces, right? Ichiku Park and stuff. That wasn't played as much. Played on Underground Garage, but it wasn't played back then. That's the stuff that you had to get turned on to. I don't know. Maybe they would play The Thrill is Gone by B.B. King on regular radio. But they never played Little Walter. How did I learn about those guys? 
I had to open up a book and see what Robert Plant and Jimmy Page were listening to, a magazine. And they'd say, oh, you got to listen to Hound Dog Taylor. I'm like, who's Hound Dog Taylor? And then I went and I'd find the Hound Dog Taylor record. I'm like, oh my God, that's how it goes. But back to the shirt, this was one of the big stores. So when anybody was playing in the city, two things. And it's funny because I'm writing a new song that's going to be part of this singles batch called What a Time We Had. And two things about big bands that came through New York. Let's say Zeppelin was playing at Madison Square Garden. Well, you knew that Jimmy Page would be at Manny's sometime that week looking at guitars. So me and my friends would go into Manny's and hang out front until our musical heroes would walk in and try out guitars. And that actually happened. Oh, it was reality. And now I don't know if you guys had that same kind of thing in England, but we had, um, you know, and, and also American bands like Leslie West, who became a friend from Mountain, was a big guitar influence of mine. And just so I don't forget to say, Jeff Beck is my favorite. Leslie West as well. Those leads on the mountain records, Mississippi Queen. But Jeff Beck just would make me cry. So we would run into these guys. Now, also, after they played their show at the Garden, they would all go to Max's Kansas City, see? That was the famous rock and roll club. So was that more of like a hangout or was it a venue as well? It was a small venue, maybe a few hundred people. But upstairs, they would have the New York Dolls. I don't know if television played there. I think Blondie must have played there. Because there was also CBGB's. CBGB's was more of an alternative, like, punky club. Max's was, you know, an Alice Cooper vibe. You know, Aerosmith played Max's when they first started. You know, everybody was there. Iggy Pop, famous gig where he cut himself with glass. So that was upstairs. Downstairs was a hang. The history of Max's was the guy who started it, Mickey Ruskin. It was sort of an art place, like Andy Warhol. People like that would hang out. This is in the 60s. And these people had no money, so they would pay him by giving a piece of their art, which is why they were all over the walls. Some of them were famous. Some of them weren't famous. Some of them became famous. And then it's like, oh, my God, we have a so-and-so. But somewhere in the early 70s, it became more of a rock and roll hangout. So what I was saying was if Zeppelin or The Who played or somebody played, Alice Cooper played at the Garden, we knew they'd go to Max's. And we knew if they went to Max's, there'd be a lot of girls at Max's. <laughs> Which is why us kids, us teenagers from Queens went and hung out there. You know what I'm saying? Didn't you meet your wife, Carol, there? I did in 1977. Yeah, I did. Yeah, same place. And listen, you know, time has a lot of effect on your memory. So there were a lot of nights where there was nobody in there. You know, it was empty. But when it was cooking, baby, it was cooking. That'd be my look. If I was on vacation over there at that time, it's like, oh, I got to go to Max's. I'd always end up on the night where there was nobody there. <laughs> well, on a Tuesday night, there might be nobody there, you know, but if Friday and Saturday night, it was packed, right? So one instance, there was a big table. There was a bar, a long bar. People would hang out there. There were some tables. The back room at Max's, which I mentioned in the song, that was the place, right? Right when you went into the back room, there was a big round table, and that's where they would stick the rock stars. And when Martha Hoople played the Eurus Theater, which I was at, and with Queen opening, first appearance of Queen, they went to Max's. They were all sitting around that table. And me and my friends, like idiots that were 16 and 17, <laughs> stood around the table, right? Just, Just watching. <laughs> yeah, gawking at them. And then all those years later, I'm Ian Hunter's guitar player. Isn't that cool? I love stuff that happens like that. It's, it's always that kind of thing where question yourself about what you're doing in music or you perhaps things aren't going as well as you hoped, but ask yourself, what would your 16-year-old self say if you told him some of this stuff? Oh, no doubt. And it's funny because that high school that I went to is having, ready for this, its 50th anniversary, the people that graduated in 73. Two things about that. So I signed up on a Facebook page for that school. First of all, it was 50 years ago. Second of all, I played the high school in 73 with my friends. Dude, we were doing, like I said, Humble Pie, we opened with, we did Savoy Brown. We probably did a Move song. We did Bowie. I mean, we were way different than any of the bands in Queens. But they keep sending me people that are signing up. I'm going to tell you right now that I probably recognize maybe three people. So I'm thinking either I had no friends back then. <laughs> Or I spent all my time in high school back in my parents' apartment listening to music. It's one or the other. Yeah. How much time was I actually in education? I don't know. But some of the people I recognize, but I was like on another planet at that point. I just cared about playing guitar. Oh, yeah. It just becomes all consuming around that time. Yeah. And by the time I got to high school, I was in this band that we used to play in the Catskill Mountains. Now, you would not know what that is. It's a way long story. You could Google it. But the Catskill Mountains, there were all these resort hotels. And it started in the 30s and the 40s where mostly Jewish families to go on vacation, like flying was not a thing, right? They would drive up. So these people saw that they loved to go to those bungalow colonies. And then they start to build these beautiful hotels, the Concord, you know, the Raleigh, famous hotels. Are we talking like in Dirty Dancing? Exactly. 
Exactly like that. So it became a thing. So by the time I started playing up there, so I joined this band and to make money, we were with a rock band in one of these hotels. You know, there was the big room, like all these famous comedians played and these famous singers that later became, you know, like Rodney Dangerfield and this one. And then there was the teen room. Parents would send the kids. And we were the band that played like Honky Tonk Woman. And, you know, I'm talking about the early 70s. Was you all in matching outfits? You know, even if I remember it, I don't know if I'd admit it. <laughs> but, you know, it's one of the things you do when you're first starting out, right? You play in these bands. So we would go up there on the weekends and we would play these places. So what my point is, like, by the time I was in high school, brother, I was already like a full time. or It wasn't a hobby. Yeah. You're already focused on where you were going. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm going to be a musician. That's it. You know, and we had fun. We were just teenagers and get plastered and try to pick up girls that came up there with their parents. You mentioned Max's Kansas City, where you met your wife, Carol. Yes. I believe it was his wife. Carol, who learned about Joan Jett looking for a guitar player, which would lead you to joining the Black Arts. Yeah, she's a famous music publicist, not the bass player. Yeah. <laughs> she was like Kiss's first publicist. She worked for Bill of Coin and a whole bunch of people that were on the coin management, Billy Squire, and people like that. She moved on to Lieber Krebs, which was a famous management company who managed Aerosmith, Nugent, Humble Pie, Def Leppard for a while, and probably others that I can't think of. And she was the publicist up there. And Joan and Joan's manager, Kenny, had the Bad Reputation album out, but they didn't really have an office yet. They were friends with one of the partners, Steve Lieber. He gave them a space up there to basically sell records out of their car and stuff. And Carol said to me one day, do you know who Joan Jett is? And I said, of course. I just saw the runaways at CBGB. You want to go down and jam with her? Now, Carol always tells me I get this wrong, but that's what I remember. And I said, yeah. So I went down and played because I didn't know why. I didn't know anything about her band. And it turns out Eric Amble, who's a wonderful guitar player and producer, he was leaving the band. And I jammed with Joan. We got along great. And I joined the band. And then we recorded the Olive Rock and Roll record. Did the band or producer or anything, did you feel you had a hit on your hands with the title track? Or was it just another song on the album? That's an interesting question. I don't know, man. Did we know? I mean, we, we, we did the record, then we went straight on the road. You're in a bubble. You don't know what's going on. I mean, you could hear the effect. You could see people singing it when you're playing. But I don't know if consciously you think it's going to be a hit. It has to do with so many things, man. Oh, God, yeah. If you look at the top 10 back then, when I Love Rock and Roll was on the charts, there wasn't anything that sounded like that. You know, there was Centerfold, you know, Jay Giles. I think maybe McCartney had a record out with maybe, is that the one that he had out with Michael Jackson? And there was nothing that sounded, the crunchy guitars like that. So the, it has to do with so many things promo mtv just started so all of a sudden there's that well that's why i was wondering did you already have the video at the time it started to blow up because that was the actually year mtv launched in 81 it probably i probably have this wrong but it probably started to blow up like i said we're on a bus we're actually in a winnebago and we're traveling and as the record's climbing up the charts they tell you it they show you that you don't know what's going you're out there playing right but you see the crowds are getting bigger and then all of a sudden they go, hey, we're getting a bus. Was you headlining or opening for somebody? Well, we were probably headlining clubs at that point. But as the record got better, then we started to get asked to be on tours. So we were opening for ZZ Top, Deep Purple, The Police, did a lot of big, big summer events with like Journey and REO Speedwagon and like in stadiums. So as the record is getting bigger, we're starting to do those things. You know, now you have two buses, one for the crew, and that's how it works, you know. We mentioned earlier that obviously your love of UK bands. Was it the Black Arts that you first got to visit the UK? And didn't you open for Queen? Yes, we did. We opened for Queen in, I think it was Milton Keynes. Insane. Milton Keynes Bowl. Is that a giant 70,000 or something like that? Yeah, we did that. You also got to remember, we would come in and sometimes, I think we watched Queen. Yeah, I think we probably watched Queen that night. But most of the time when you're the opening act, you get on a bus and you travel to the next place. So the point being is you don't always watch the band that you're opening for. I remember watching ZZ Top, Deep Purple. We did a bunch of shows with Jay Giles. I mean, I have my diaries. Someday I'll open them up when I'm in the old folks' home and I got nothing to read. <laughs> <laughs> ah, remember when we opened for... You know, we played with Chuck Berry, you know, I like all kinds of stuff. And we did a lot of TV. We did like Top of the Pops, of course. And this is an interesting story. We did Top of the Pops and McCartney was on. And I'm going to say Linda was there. You're just ticking all your teenage idol boxes at this point. Yeah. So he loved the song and I'm standing on the side, you know, after we finished, he goes, ah, or, or maybe I went over and introduced myself. And he said, um, yeah, I love that song, you know. And I, me being like a fan, I said, hey, could you sign? Can I get you to sign something? All I had was like a, was it 20 pound note? Pulled it out of my wallet. He signed it. And of course, back then I was a maniac. You spent it, didn't you? <laughs> you got around, didn't you? Do I have to finish the story? <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
I remember being at a bar with some of the guys in the band, maybe the crew, and I ran out of all of the money. And they're still drinking. They're like, Give me Jack Daniels and a pint. And I get to that one and I look at it and I go, ah, what the hell? Oh, no. Now, so all these years later at the Rock Hall, when we were inducted into the Rock Hall, at the after party. So you saw I played in the finale with Paul and Ringo and Joe Walsh and all these people. I remember at the after party, I said, I got a funny story to tell you. And I told him <laughs> the story and he just stared at me like he didn't think it was funny. Oh, no. no. You didn't pull a $20 bill out. Let's make up for it. No, no. You, you could hear him thinking, you did what? But he got a great story out of it. He got the story. That's worth it. Yeah, you know, what can I tell you? The UK continued to be a huge part of your career. Uh, you went with John Waite. Also, Roger Daltrey, you mentioned you got to record at Abbey Road as well. That must have been a big pinch me moment. Yeah, we did half the Daltrey record in New York and half of it at Abbey Road. And then we came back and we did a radio tour and then played a couple of cool places like Carnegie Hall. Yeah, man, Abbey Road. I remember there was a lady there. There's a lunchroom. And this lady that was probably this, she was there since the Beatles. You know, she had a, a netting on her head. And we, of course, like idiots, we went, so did you serve the Beatles? Oh, yes, Paul, he would come in and he would ask for, you know. And we would sit there listening to these stories all wide-eyed and stuff. Yeah, I have a picture somewhere of that room upstairs where you look down into the giant room and you see the piano. Like, it's a famous picture. And I got pictures from there and I go, wow, that's sick. And I got to sit and toy around on that piano. And yeah, it was Abbey Road, man. Can't imagine the magic that's created in there. Just so much history just in that one room. It's unreal. I wish I paid attention more when it was happening. I mean, for Roger back then, I mean, I got sober in 87, so I was already fully aware of where I was. And then, of course, we went out in the street. And they took a picture of me walking across the street. And when I got home, I realized when I looked at the real pictures that I was walking in the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. You can Photoshop it now, though. You could probably flick it on Photoshop. This is the New York version, man. You know. <laughs> when was the last time you got to perform over here, Ricky? Oh, God. I'm going to say it was when I was playing. I did about a year and a half playing with Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes. So we played there. Don't ask me the place. I can't remember. But that was the last time I played in London. I haven't been there in ages. My daughter just came back. She graduated college and she did one last study abroad thing. And she was in London. And oh, fantastic. She enjoy it. Yeah, she did. She didn't understand some of the food choices. <laughs> Or why they didn't serve, like, if you ordered something to drink, like a soda or something like that, or water, there was no ice in it. You know, you had to ask for ice. Ice is a big thing for you guys. Ice and air conditioning and stairs. You don't like our stairs. Everywhere's got stairs. Yeah, yeah. But remember, when I first went there with Joan, there was nothing. There were two TV stations. And this is how, this is the lifespan of a fly. You know, This is what you'd be watching. That and Top of the Pops was on, and maybe Monty Python. Could you see yourself out on tour playing in someone else's band again, or are you fully focused on your own material? I cannot see that. I mean, I would never shut the door on anything. Like, I have some bucket list stuff. Not to go on tour with somebody, but I think I've toured quite enough. I could see doing short things, but I can't imagine doing that as a lifestyle. But I would love to play Maggie May once with Rod Stewart standing next to me. Because that was such a big teenage song for me. And, you know, this, spiking your hair up and, you know... <laughs> It's out there now. You've put it out there, so it might happen. Yeah. And I'd love to, wouldn't you love to stand on stage? And, and listen, because of where I am in my career, like I get asked to do these events and be on this. I mean, if you looked at my bio and see who I played yeah, with. It's insane. Three quarters of that is because I get asked to be in these house bands where I'm in the all-star band, right? We used to do this thing at the Rock Hall every year. And I was in the house band with Liberty DeVito on drums, you know, Billy Joel's drummer and Jeff Carlisi from 38 Special. Like there was a bunch of us. We were like this, mostly that band. And then if somebody couldn't make it, they'd be a, you know, a sub. And that's what that list is. Playing I'll Take You There with Mavis Staples or playing Duke of Earl with Earl Chandler even. Have you always been a pretty well-prepared guy for those situations? Well, I learned to be quickly, brother. I always say be ready or go home. <laughs> well, listen, when you're on the tour with a band, see, the main thing is, you know the material because you're basically playing the same song for freaking years. The key to that is making each night seem like the first night you played them. That's what that is. When you're doing one of these events, it made me a way better guitar player. They would send me, sometimes it was Will Lee from the David Letterman band, you know, on bass. He's used to reading charts and stuff. I can't read music, but I, I could make cheat charts. But he would send me this stuff and I would have to learn the songs off the records because I can't read charts. So you would sit there and you would listen to, you know, we did like You Don't Know Like I Know with Sam Moore from Sam and Dave. You see on the list, it's like everybody. 
played with Sheila E. I mean, it's just ridiculous. But it keeps you on your toes, man. Oh, gotcha. And it certainly makes you a better guitar player. And I've been doing that for 20 years. It's not often, especially the pandemic shut everything down. But I've done like three or four since everything opened up again, where I'm backing up this one or that one. And I, and I got to learn their material. And it made me you know, made me a soul guitar player. It made me this kind of guitar player. I'm pretty well versed in everything except jazz. Jazz and classical, baby. Just call somebody else. <laughs> you learn so much. I mean, that's why I was thinking you can study so much in your bedroom, but it's always been about playing with other people. And when you're playing with all these different people all the time, you're just taking on board all this knowledge. Not only that, but like, you know, how about doing three songs with Smokey Robinson? Not a bad little gig. <laughs> and like in the middle of like tracks of my tears, he like, you know, turns to you for the solo. It's like, oh, what? Shit. wait, what? Huh? I mean, I would get like teary eyed. Like, it's like crazy. When I did the tour with Ian Hunter, remember, I was a huge Mata Hoover fan. I told you, I went to that show in 71, maybe, 72. We're in England now. So we already did the Swedish end. You know, really cool gigs and all over Sweden. Really great gigs. Sometimes hotel lobbies, right, in Sweden, where it would be the lobby and there would be a stage and get there and the lobby's packed with, you know, Mott fans and Ian fans. We get to England. And Mick Ronson had just passed away, so everybody's holding signs. We miss you, Mick, and stuff like that. So there's no pressure, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm the guitar player. But we start off all the young, or I start off all the young dudes, and we did it just like he did on the live record, where I started off really low. I get to the end of the riff, and he goes, louder, and the band kicks in. I just started crying. I had to turn around. I was I was like... I was going to say, did you have to turn you back to audience at that point? Yeah, it was like I had to compose myself. I was like, wow, I've done okay. That's to tell your 16-year-old self. Well, I got to be exactly who I wanted to be, you know? Mission accomplished, mate. <laughs> and it's not about money or no money or because, you know, there's only the top tier that really gets the big payoff. You know, the rest of us work hard forever, but we get to do what we want to do, see? So these records are get back and wait at the beginning of this thing. I decided to put out singles, but now I have 14 songs. Like I keep submitting them. And, you know, what do you do if you have 14 songs? So we'll see what happens. You know, I just keep handing them in. Every six weeks, they would put out another song. And listen, if you think that I don't sit in my car when I'm listening to Underground Garage and, you know, the new one from Ricky Bird comes on, it's Luann. And it sounds like freaking Little Richard when the riff comes in. I'm like, wow. This is cool, man. You become a fan again. I'll be sitting there driving by myself and go, wow, what a great rip. Oh, wait, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky, I'll let you go, man. I don't want to keep you too long, but I'm stoked that you're so still excited about music as you was way back in the day. There's nothing like writing a good song and you know, and you go, wow, that's not bad, you know? But because of social media, people hear stuff. So Luann is like a recovery tune, right? It's the only one. If you listen to the lyrics, it's all about somebody struggling. So you could use it as struggling from whatever. If somebody messages you on Instagram or something and said, man, that song really helped. With my struggle, I identified with it. It goes, yeah, man, I'm no Bob Dylan, bro, but I'm doing my part in trying to help. You know, my songs hopefully mean something to people. And what else could you ask for? You know, this is what I was sat in that room that we started with in Queens with the giant headphones we all had listening to, you know, Zeppelin doing You Shook Me or something like that. And then here I am and I'm still making music. I want to wish you all the success with all the upcoming singles and the current one, Luann. It's been a pleasure to speak to you, mate. I've loved it. Thanks. You could go on rickybird.com. You could actually purchase my last couple of records on my website. There's always cool stuff there. This new one's on Wicked Cool Records and you can hear it on Little Stevens Underground Garage. But I want to make one last point. Me and every other musician are so happy and thrilled that you, what's the, what's the word, the British word? Chaff, chaff, chaff. What's that word? Chuffed? Chuffed. Is that means that we love that you do something? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Chuffed to bits. Yeah, we're chuffed to bits that you love, that you guys love to hear the music, but it's a different world and we need you guys to stream it to death. Why? Because that's how we wind up on the charts if they see, you know, a lot of streams. And also, go on and download the single. You love the music that we're still playing and putting out there? Go out there and support it, man. That's it. That was my public service announcement. <laughs> Hey, should I call my next, if this comes out as a record, should I call it Chuffed to Bits? Chuffed to Bits, yeah. <laughs> Is that a, that's a real saying, right? Chuffed to Bits, yeah. Maybe I should. That's a great title. Now somebody, somebody's going to do it before me. Exclusive. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. You enjoy the rest of your day. It's been a pleasure, man. Nice talking to you, man.
Massive thanks to the awesome Ricky Bed for sharing stories with us right here on the Straight to Video podcast. I love hearing all those early New York adventures, so it was a blast to chat and learn a little more about such an electric time. Keep in touch with all that Ricky is up to over at rickybaird.com and you can check out the new single Luan, which is available from Wicked Cool Records right now. I hope you're continuing to enjoy all these chats. I'm trying to keep it as fun and as varied as possible and really appreciate it when people say they enjoyed or discovered someone they were not familiar with previously. That's a real payoff for me, so I'll continue to do my best to make them as interesting as possible. If you want to check out earlier episodes, there's almost 250 of them now. They can all be found at stvpod.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to help support this show a little more, I have a Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash stvpod, where for a small monthly donation you get extra content, early heads up on guests, and also access to exclusive merchandise. So if you can, I'd love you to support. That's patreon.com forward slash stvpod. That's all for this episode. Don't forget, birthday event at the 80s video shop in Ofton this Sunday. But if I don't see you there, I'll speak to you next Friday. So till then, always be kind. Please rewind and unwind and I'll speak to you all real soon. <laughs>